Sean Berry. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Good. good oh, hello. I liked it when you did that. It was almost like I'd interrupted you. You were like, oh, hi there. You know, like in those... Those uh, yeah, I did. I did very slightly. Just check my printer one last time. Wasn't still. Oh, making... hi. <laughs> oh hello. Oh hi saying? there. If you just joined us, um, do you like the fact that I've come dressed in green party? For those who are listening to the podcast, I'm wearing a green. I'm wearing a very a, a green, a kind of turquoise green, but it's still green. Um, shirt. Well, thank you very much. I'm not. I'm dressed in black and grey. So there you go. Well, who's the authentic green now, eh? I've got my green curtains. Everyone keeps commenting on my green curtains. They are quite yeah, green. They are very astonishingly green. That's true. Right. Let me just bam you straight with it. Should Keir Starmer be worried about you? I think he should be listening to us. That's that's for sure. Um, I mean, if he is facing problems with his party at the moment, and if he wants to look and learn lessons from us, then he needs to think about standing for a bit more, quite honestly. I don't know. Um, I mean, you probably saw that I was on Andrew Marr um a week and a bit ago and this was as part of a series of interviews with with leaders so I had to sort of go back and watch the previous interviews that had been with the other leaders and one of them was Keir Starmer and it absolutely I didn't watch it on the day that it was broadcast but it absolutely was so frustrating and so clearly demonstrating the problems that that, that Keir Starmer is having with with not standing for enough, not being a strong enough opposition and not stating clear enough what he thinks. Now, one of the questions was about teachers and whether or not teachers, whether schools should go back and, and whether teachers should get vaccinations. And he wouldn't take a position. Um, and I should definitely go back and watch it because he said over and over again, there's a strong case and then wouldn't actually call for it. And you just think, well, if what is your job if you're a politician? And then on Brexit, the it was even worse. Um, essentially, Andrew Marr said to him, um, is there anything about the Brexit deal you would change? And Keir Starmer said, there's no appetite to reopen that. We're aiming to win an election in 2024. And when that happens, we'll inherit this deal and we'll make the best of it. Now, that, again, is not there's three whole years to go of opposition where there's negotiations and negotiations to go on Brexit. There's immediate problems that are really obvious with the way that we're leaving and things that need to change for which a strong opposition making the case to go back to Europe and talk to people is really important. So effectively what he said was we've got a car with three wheels that isn't going very fast, but we'll we'll make the best of it and head for the motorway anyway. And, and I absolutely just could not, I, was, I kind of, you know, if you're a Labour supporter and you're, you're pro-European or you're just up for having somebody stand for something like getting the teachers the vaccinations they need, then watching that kind of interview, that kind of obfuscation just must absolutely have you shouting at the telly because he's not, you know, he's not my leader, he's, a, but he's part of the opposition. And I just wish that there was a bit more united opposition and people coming behind some very strong calls to do something about these very immediate problems that we're facing. So that's a very long answer, but that's, yeah, you should... <laughs> He should look to us for, for strong, strong positions taken in ways that are that are that are sensible, that are that are good opposition, that are, you know, looking to do the best for the country. And he just isn't really doing that at the moment. And it just, yeah, I don't know why. I can sort of see the argument for for not wanting to undermine the government during a crisis, but if the government is being too um risk taking with people's public health then then strongly opposing that and saying arguing strongly for more caution is surely something you should be doing i mean before obviously i'm going to ask you about the greens but not i'm not just interviewing about Keir Starmer, my promise but what do you think labor stands for now well i you know it's 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 slightly hard to tell i mean i think in you know i mean i work in london um and quite clearly there there's a difference between um, Sadiq Khan and, and the Conservatives that I work with on the London Assembly and you know in some areas um, I'm opposing Sadiq Khan over things like building the Silvertown Tunnel, um, I'm pushing him to go further on things like um, at the moment it's um, youth homelessness funding, um, getting on with spending some of the um, housing um, grants that we have that are just sitting idly on the shelf and he's being very cautious about that so just pushing him to do more of what he's doing 
um and some things to do with like air pollution and crime and civil liberties he should be standing up more for civil liberties um so there's a clear difference between him and the conservatives particularly i think on the civil liberties side of things where they're gung-ho for almost everything where he's somewhere in the middle and i'm trying to argue for something that's that's more respectful of human rights and more um more open to scrutiny and accountability which the police are resisting a lot at the moment but there so there's big differences there but on the national stage it seems like the strategy of labor is to try and make there be as little difference as possible um and just to sort of wait it out and win the next election by default and to me that's not political leadership so so that's probably very disappointing so polls show at the moment that the Greens are increasing their support. And it seems to be the sense of the Labour Party. So I suppose I was going to ask you, is there a Green surge? And I would cast our minds back to 2015 when I did write an article for The Guardian at the time saying the Greens are surging. Ooh. And actually, the Greens did all right at the 2015 election, considering got over a million votes. But they were up to 11, you were up to 11% at one point in 2015 and then came down much, much lower so basically what I'm asking is, are the Greens surging or, as history suggests, are you going to surge and then go... Poof? Well, um, it, I mean, we are growing. We're growing. We've grown in our membership every single month, month on month for the last 12 months. But it's not at the same suddenness as it was um, in that sort of... And the, the time that happened was actually 2014 was the very, very big Green surge when we were excluded from the debates. And um, then we were suddenly included in the debates. And so there was a lot of interest in the sort of fair play aspect of involving us in the debates. And then when they actually heard what we were saying, and in that election, we were very unique um, in the run up to the 2015 election, being against austerity. Again, Labour at the time were triangulating really badly and trying not to um, go outside of the mainstream. So they were backing austerity effectively and saying it was the only way to go. And we were very clearly saying no 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 that's and so that got us a lot of tension got us a lot of people who were looking for a different way who were looking for something um that actually stood for something and agreed with their values and um also somewhat the climate change issue as well so we got a very very sudden surge of people in in that sort of short period in the run-up to 2015 the actual election itself squeezed us so we didn't end up with 11 percent of the vote that would have been nice um and so that that sort of dropped off a little bit then but it isn't that fast at the moment but it is more healthy i think i think because we've got this sustained growth over a much longer period because people aren't joining just to make a point they're joining after some consideration um they're joining for a, you know positive reasons they're actually thinking about getting involved and, and standing for things and i think part of the reason people are joining in greater numbers is because they're seeing local councillors getting elected. We doubled our number of councillors. We, we increased the number of councils on which we have councillors. So a lot more people around the country now have a green on their council. And so people are seeing that it's a practical step to join the Greens. It's not just a statement. It's not just a protest. It's actually, I will join this group who are gaining some power, who will make a difference, who've got a voice that I support locally and and I, I want to join for very practical reasons like that. So I think there's a lot of healthy surging into the Greens and it's not as dramatic, but it is more sustainable and, and it's building up a stronger party, a more resilient party as a result as well, um, because we're able to just plan better when we've got regular income coming in from new members and and more activists growing at a regular rate so we're not having to cope cope with suddenly having thousands more people wanting to help and not having the infrastructure we're building up that infrastructure and it's and it's it's bringing new activists into itself in a much more sustainable way so it's, yeah it's good very healthy and who is flocking to the greens because you know the stereotype come on let's be honest we all know the stereotype that the greens are painted as very middle class bit bohemian Knitted jumpers, I don't know where I got that from. Um, something to do with muesli, nothing wrong with muesli, by the way. Um, and uh, I don't know, just the interesting knitwear, kind of eccentric radicals of a of a certain type who aren't, you know, who who aren't able to build beyond that. What do you say about that caricature? You know, the caricature is a caricature thrown around, particularly the right wing media. 
keep going. You'll you'll get onto the things that, that Boris says in a minute. Um, no, no, it, there's a there's a much wider range of people joining now. I think particularly in age, we were a, we were a, a slightly older party. I think um, our average age was was older. Um, a lot more young people are joining us now. Obviously, that has something to do with things like the school strikes. Um, and the climate movements, which are very, very led by young people. Um, and so there's lots more young people joining in those for those kinds of reasons. But then also people, like I say, who've seen exemplars of, of big council groups and they see people like um, the big council group in, in Solihull, where you've got um, Rosie Sexton there, who stood against me for leader, but she's absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and so you see these people that are like you and you want to go and... Um, join them and in becoming the people who run the council and doing some really important community work locally. So you've got people with diff those kinds of motivations as well who are joining. And then I think people across the left who who maybe used to be in us in 14, 15, when we were the only party standing against austerity, who maybe have gone back to Labour um, and maybe become disillusioned some of the new members are certainly are coming from that side of the left but again I think it's not so much the old left like in terms of age but also um the sort of the more sort of statist left it's, it's people who are somewhere on the more community and and devolved power side of of, of politics on the left as well I think who are coming over to us so it's not so much um, I don't think the more traditional left. I think the traditional left are, are hanging in there a little bit more with Labour. If that's that's just almost pure guesswork, but it's based on meeting a lot of people and talking to people and some of the stated reasons that people give for joining us as well. Um, UKIP and the Brexit Party never won a parliamentary seat. The Greens have won a parliamentary seat. I mean, UKIP got defections from the Tories, so they did get MPs, but but, but Nigel Farage stood again and again and again and famously has never won a seat. But they did transform British politics. I mean, they hugely, they, they're the ones who made sure, basically, we got a referendum, uh, which then triggered the takeover of the Conservative Party by the Tory right. Like, we've been UKIPified as a, as a country by a party which has no electoral success in parliamentary terms at all. So I suppose the question I'm putting to you is, could the Greens be the UKIP of the left? Could your success be in forcing the Labour Party to engage with issues and to come onto certain political terrain that they wouldn't otherwise do because they go, oh, no, the Greens are on our patch and we need to stop them uh, taking away some of our votes. I, I think all kind of politics is a, is a bit like that. You sort of stake out your um, political space and then you try and um, increase that political space, you know, push it into the mainstream, and then that forces the other parties to to take notice of the of, of the space you've created, take notice of the issues that you're raising, um, and the positions that you're taking. So that is that is definitely part of our job, and it's part of our job in in yeah, every country, basically. Um, I think you know one of the problems in this country is the lack of a proportional system, so that when a party does gain 10, 15 percent of the vote, it, it doesn't gain 10 or 15 percent of the seats and therefore has to sort of settle into the, the process of, of governing and, and being elected. And I think UKIP definitely suffered from that. They got to stay as a fringe operation that wasn't were involved in the, the serious day to day work of scrutiny, of opposition, of of being in Parliament and and all of those things. And and actually they were happy with that. And we're and we're not. We want to be involved in um day to day politics. We want to win power. We want to start running things um according to our our whole program, not just to convince other parties to shift towards us on a few issues. But there's definitely a campaigning side to the Greens. And I think one of the things that that having even just a couple of greens on your council can do is ensure that that those issues and and those kinds of campaigns are represented in local politics and do push councils to, um and 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 it does happen in parliament with caroline as well um to to take on issues that even though we haven't got the votes to just put it forwards and have it voted for us raising it does does then push it onto the agenda um forces it into you know scrutiny or or um the the answers that you can get to questions the facts come out and then the position changes so there's much more you can do as an elected person than you can as a 
as a campaigner and working with campaigns is something that a lot of Greens who are elected do do as well. So there's there's our theory of change is 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 actually a mixture of getting elected, working with movements and changing minds. And I think that's different to I think Labour and I you know I could over characterize what I hear from from a lot of Labour people. But it's like, yeah, wait, what I said about Keir Starmer earlier, you know, it's like wait, win all the power and then achieve the stuff you want to achieve. We are doing it in a variety of ways, some of which involves gaining power and some of which involves changing um the political environment in using other tactics too um as you pointed out the greens in 2014 2015 really took the mantle of anti-austerity a time when labor weren't offering a coherent alternative to the tories cuts agenda they were offering essentially a form of austerity light at the time they were um after 2015 obviously labor shifted its political position very dramatically and a lot of the people who supported voted for and even mem- and members of the Green Party defected to Labour. Now, I wrote in this recent Guardian column about watermelons who are uh, who are red on the inside, green on the outside. They're lefty greens. And also, I wrote about um, what have I done? What was the other one? Wait a minute. Hold on. Figs. What was the other one? The one you made up. It was figs. <laughs> Not made up, it was briefed to me by a Green Party person. But what was the other one? Mangoes. Mangoes, yeah, sorry. Mangoes, which are yellow, of course. And basically, watermelons, red inside, are the lefty greens. And the mangoes are essentially Lib Dems. They're Lib Dems, Lib Demi. And what happened was, as Labour shifted to the left, you lost a lot of watermelons. In fact, to be honest with you, a couple of people at least one of whom was James Schneider, one of Jamie Corbyn's right-hand men, voted for the Greens in 2015. So you had Green voters work, literally working for the leader of the opposition. Um, and what happened with the Greens is they shifted into a more anti... You know, instead of being about anti-austerity, they they took on the mantle of the main, ended up making alliances with Lib Dems and Change UK-type politicians and seemed more to be a home for centrist types who were more angry about Brexit, you know, one of your senior politicians, um, Molly, a MEP, she said if she'd have had a vote in 2015, she'd have voted for Yvette Cooper in the leadership election. So I suppose the question I put is some would say the Greens are kind of a bit opportunistic. They will shapeshift based on where Labour is positioning themselves. And when Labour wasn't being anti-austerity enough, they went, right, we'll do that. But then Labour shifted to the left and their, the big thing was Brexit. They went, ah, we'll l- latch onto that instead. That's my challenge to you. Answer it. I don't even know where to start with all of this, right? Because figs are not a thing. <laughs> For one, I don't even know where you got that from. Can I explain and- what figs, what I said were? Figs are are the kind of deep green, anarcho- they're kind of a, so anarcho-syndicalist. That's what was briefed to me. I didn't make it up. I've, I've never heard of it. It's, it's been mentioned previously. Um, and also, I mean, mangoes aren't really a thing either. There are there aren't any greens out there who are sort of secretly Lib Dem or, or pursuing another agenda. And what you're, I, yeah, this idea that that you're you're accusing us of being opp- opportunistic when actually we are ridiculously consistent, absolutely ridiculously. I mean, on austerity, we are unbelievably consistent. We we've got policy that involves investing in a Green New Deal. We've had this for such a long time, like Caroline Lucas joined the Green New Deal um, sort of group, the original one in about 2007. I went to the launch of it um, and it was such a long time ago and it was so the original thing to do and it was investment in a Green New Deal that was the way out of the first financial crisis that she was arguing for there. Um, And we've had, for example, I mean, we, we talk about investment also in people, through a universal basic income. That's come really to the fore as a result of um, the coronavirus crisis exposing so many of the gaps that there are in the welfare system um, and the support that there is for people and the, the the lurch you can be left in if you've got precarious work and that suddenly disappears. And um, it's been absolutely awful. So we've had that policy forever and we push it every single election. And on Europe, there's no... There's no way in which we were ever being opportunistic here. We we had the debate about um, being pro or anti Brexit. Um, we 
had that debate about all our values and the, the reason that we went for being anti-Brexit, even though we have severe criticisms of some of the ways in which the European Union was working, some of the, you know, fixing the democracy, we had MEPs on the scene going, yes, things need to change. But ultimately, we came out for the values of supporting internationalism, being part of what we often characterise as a peace project and a project of togetherness between nations, and then you know, practically for the people, free movement and the importance of that, and standing up for um, you know, migrants and the and the you know, standing up for the right to economic migration is something that's that's right there in the values that we picked to fight that Brexit referendum with, and we've just stayed true to that all the way through, all the way through. There's no sense in which we. We're going to change our policy for political gain. Um, the reason we picked supporting a people's vote was was to give the country the continued way out of what was going to be um, obviously a very difficult exit policy, exit strategy. The, the, the negotiations were not going well. We needed to, to ask for people to have a final say, um, given that the Brexit that was being delivered wasn't what was on the ballot paper in 2016 um and and yeah within the pro-european movement we've been the troublemakers we've been the ones complaining like hell that the the um the people's vote campaign the earlier referendum campaign would not stop putting forwards big centrist men as the, as the spokespeople i don't know if you you probably had the same sort of um reaction to to constantly seeing michael heseltine and um alistair campbell appearing on the television as the spokespeople of the um the pro-european side um utterly wrong in my view we should have had people who are european who live here, who were people, people who value their freedom of movement, people who, who work in the industries that would suffer talking about this. And instead, it was just like, you know, Michael Heseltine, a big, big authoritarian or authoritative man telling us what to do. And it was just completely wrong. So, yeah, this is, a, you know, we did this for values reasons. We did this for reasons that were that were principled and democratically decided with our party. And we've stuck with them. Things like being anti-austerity, things like being pro-European. So there's no sense of that within the party at all. One of the things, I mean, when you talk about, I suppose, the traditional left or whatever, one of the things that people in the Labour Party, even when they're kind of annoyed with the leadership, that's very important to them is trade unions. Because, of course, Labour, the clue is in the name, was founded by the Labour movement to give unions a, a political voice. And unions are the biggest democratic movement in the country. They represent over six million uh, workers. Uh, that They have a majority are women, uh, though that's not represented sufficiently at the top of, a, of the Labour movement. Of course, Francis O'Grady is uh, the, the head of the TUC, the Trade Union Congress. I suppose my question is about what's the Greens' relationship or view of unions? Because, uh, I mean, for example, there was, I know it was a painful memory, but in Brighton, the Green Council years ago ended up in the protracted industrial dispute with striking refuse collectors. And some of the rhetoric that came from the Green Party leader, who I think was very mango uh, was the sort of rhetoric about trade unions you would associate, I would say, with the right and kept making comparisons with the winter of discontent in the late 70s. And also, I mean, take an example, whatever you think about state funding, you know, the, a previous, uh, the manifesto in 2015 said, bring in a fair system of state funding for political parties. So there's no longer a need for reliance on private and trade union donations, which can have a corrupting effect. I suppose the problem from a That's kind of... To put it, actually, now you, now you point that out. Yeah, I mean, from a kind of... Yeah. My view, on the, my very, very passionate view on the left is big business are corporate interests who are, by definition, selfish and looking to maximise profit. Trade unions are democratic organisations that represent millions of working people who are the pillars of society so compare you know comparing them as vested interests that have a corrupting influence i find worrying it's a, it's yeah. a traditional big l capital l uh, view that any mass or collective organization should just be compared to each other regardless of their of the power relations so what is the has the greens have they moved on on trade unions a lot of people on the left 
and the Labour Party will be like, tempted by the Greens, not happy with the Labour leadership, but trade unionism is in my blood. What would you say to them? I mean, I I think you, you make some good points, actually, there about, um, you know, not wanting to to use you know, comparing big trade unions with big business isn't isn't the right thing to do and i think we've we've definitely moved on from that a lot of the work we do is is with unions like i you know talked about the teachers earlier on we've got a, a good relationship with the national education union now our spokesperson vix uh Lothian, who's on the isle of Wight, um is a teacher and she's been absolutely great throughout this crisis at just you know, liaising and making sure that we're 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 listening really hard to them we've also you know, worked really hard within and particularly London um, to support the um, United Workers related unions um, that are supporting the precarious <laughs> workers. And so that's that's kicked off in City Hall, supporting the unions representing the Uber drivers, for example. We've supported people um, working in support of um Sort of career, bicycle couriers, um, people who are the, some of the cleaners, the cleaners at SOAS, for example, all represented by the family of unions that are in the the sort of the more independent, smaller unions there, the the international workers related ones, and that's been really good and really really excellent. Sort of each side supporting each other, the Greens supporting the unions, giving them more prominence, bringing their voices into City Hall in particular. Um, but also, you know, get, gaining some more perspective from those kinds of workers and getting some members and 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 just just doing more things together. That's been really really good. Um, obviously, there are you know there are big un the big unions have got bigger and bigger because of all the mergers, um, and I you know that does mean that there's a there's a if they're affiliated to Labour, they won't necessarily come and work with us or talk to us in in the same way. But I I just like I'd like to make you know better closer. Um, links with them too and certainly as a local councillor I've worked with my unison branch an awful lot representing um, their interests to the to the council um, and um, there's been some really good work done by the Green New Deal and NEF with um, the PCS union around what you can do um, in the area around Gatwick to, to support aviation workers and their transferable skills in how you might have a Green New Deal around there that was very specifically about a transition away from aviation jobs into things that are more sustainable. And that's really interesting work and has to be union and worker led, I think, that kind of transition work. And that's something I'd like to get more involved in. A lot of people do want to vote for the Greens. Far more people in the country want to vote for the Greens than actually do vote for the Greens. And the reason they don't is for something we agree on, which is the electoral system of this country punishes parties like yourselves. So you got well over a million votes back in 2015, if it was put a proportionate system, you would have got, for, for a start, more seats, but also you would have got more votes and therefore even more seats because people would have voted according to their, their conscience. But we have a first-past-the-post system where the truth is you either end up with a Labour government or a Conservative government. And a lot of people, therefore, will come to the conclusion that if they vote for your party in marginal seats, that's where is very close between Labour and the Conservatives, they're going to wake up with a Conservative MP. And that will be a Conservative MP who is rubbish on the climate, who is rubbish on poverty, housing, and all the things you care about. So you end up, I mean, as classic, and by the way, is worth giving huge credit to the Greens in 2017, above all else, when lots of Green parliamentary candidates uh, stood down at the behest of local Green parties to avoid that eventuality because people realised what was at stake. But just an example, take Stroud in 2019. Stroud. How did I know you were going to bring up Stroud? Well, it's a striking example. I mean, I give it, you know, Molly Scott Cato, I really respect her. Molly Scott, Scott Cato was a person who said, as an example, that she would have voted for Yvette Cooper in 2015 in the leadership election if she was a Labour member. David Drew was a left-wing Labour candidate. And what happened was is he lost the Tory majority is 3,840 and the Greens got nearly 5,000 votes. So if people had voted Labour instead of Green, I mean, that wouldn't have swung the election, just to be very clear. The reason yeah. Labour lost horrifically in the last elections had nothing to do with the Greens. But how do you just get over that central dilemma? And you would say, that's not fair. Come on, people should vote for their consciences. I agree, but we are stuck with this electoral system. So what do you say to people in those marginal seats? Because they're like, well, I don't want the Tories to win, so I'm, I can't vote for you even though I want to. 
I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot there. I mean, I think one thing we have to get clear here is that with what happened in 2017 wasn't nice, certainly. Um, I mean, what happened was it did stand down um, in areas where you know, that harmed our national vote share um and it and it resulted in in you know loss of funding for caroline lucas's office this was really painful for our party and a lot of them stood down because they were bullied into it and i can't have that as as leader of a party i can't i couldn't have in 20 2019 have gone into that election without something stronger to support people uh with and so what we did was we we did put out the feelers to every single party um, in the opposition and say, shall we talk? Um, and that resulted in, in, in a three-way agreement between Plaid Cymru, the, the Lib Dems and us. But that was months and months and months of very careful, very tentative, lots of false starts, proper talking together and eventually agreeing on, on quite a small agreement across um I'm trying to remember now, 60 seats I think it was in the end um and it did make a difference you know it did lead to some some seats being won um but it would have been much more effective had Labour got involved as well and so where I'm heading with this and this is I'm sorry to interrupt my answer but it's very distracting the fact that you focus your camera only on me so I can't see your face when I'm talking to you Erin oh isn't it but that's because we're trying to give you the platform well that's fine except that I can't see you your eyes is or what you're reacting oh, I think, well we could keep it there but that, but the yeah. day, just to explain i want to ruin the magic as well for the viewer when i'm looking at you i'm doing this but when i'm looking at the camera i am now i'm not i can't see you so in order to hide that illusion which we've now ruined by the way for the audience Sorry. Uh, <laughs> i and to give you the full stage we get rid yeah. of my stupid but I feel Nicole like I'm showing you the point that I can't see your reaction. So. Okay, well, I'll keep you there, but I will and have... And here I'm to... trying to persuade you of, of a point of view, so I need to see whether I've got you with me, basically. Well, okay, well, I, I, but what do you want me to do? Look at the camera, look at you. This is a real dilemma. But just to explain for people listening on the podcast, what I'm now doing is looking at my computer screen so I can see Sean, rather than the camera, which is behind it. And now I can't see her, but if I stare at the computer screen, it doesn't look like I'm looking at you, but we can do this. We could try. Um, so, yeah, so what I'm saying is effectively that there are two ways to do this. There are no one talks to anybody and everybody just gets on Twitter and harasses each other's candidates and, and, and it uses up a lot of energy that could be spent trying to to beat the Conservatives in the most sort of, you know, without without shouting about tactical voting or anything, just, just competing for the votes and making your positive case. I'm accusing you of being Labour right now, by the way. Uh, making Labour, making their positive case for why they should win and us making our positive case and the voters deciding. Um, instead, a lot of energy goes into these tactical arguments and, and quite vicious, you know, there's a, there's a, there's more or less bad blood now between Molly and the Labour Party, which there shouldn't be because in the local elections that come next in Stroud, there is a chance for the Greens and the Labour Party to work together to take the county council off the Conservatives. Should we not be doing that together instead of going so over these old grounds? But in the future elections, we have to, we have a choice, you know, either there's a, a either Labour makes the case that there is absolutely no doubt they are going to bring in PR and we trust and believe them and therefore the argument that that we might unilaterally go and say well you know it's it's just for one election and therefore it's worth the sacrifice to, to but, but quite honestly Justin Trudeau has ruined that by <laughs> going saying he was going to do that in Canada and then going back on it almost immediately so that's not that's not necessarily going to work but the other alternative is to talk to each other is to talk to each other about you know should we come to some sort of agreement and I know that it's against Labour's rules for them to stand down but we could come to an agreement about something else at least to be talking about how we do this would be sensible um and and to get something if, if you want us to all stand down because you're going to bring in PR and that's going to be the last election ever and it's worth the sacrifice, that needs to be cast iron. So it's going to, it would have to be an, a written agreement again. And, and so well, that's the that's way to do it is to start talking now because it takes, we know from the experience with the, with Plaid and the Lib Dems that, that parties aren't 
naturally going to trust each other, that it takes time, that it takes a bit of, you know, proving that you can be trusted and 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 all of that and and no tricks and no surprises and all of that needs to be built in so there's no yeah I'm not I'm not going to go through another 2017 it was hard it was damaging it was it was a waste of lot of a lot of people's efforts and 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 time and and, and all of that um and 2019 was was proved a principle but wasn't wasn't wide enough. So yeah, I suppose like- the question then is, uh, and by the way, I'm glad you slagged off Justin Trudeau because I can't, I actually cannot stand him. And um, I mean, for so many reasons, yeah, multiple reasons. <laughs> Oil pipelines. Let's just like, yeah. I was going to say his promises on the climate. Uh, when I went to Canada in 2016, Canadians told me they were like basically we elected a gym instructor, which was quite funny. Um, but he's just a very vacuous politician um, who has charisma and, and good looks, but no substance but anyway that's not relevant to our discussion what i would say is in terms of a so-called progressive alliance and there are figures within the labor party like clive lewis for example the labor mp who supports uh, a progressive alliance i guess i'm asking i'm wondering kind of what how would it work because i suppose i mean in terms of standing down as you say labor constitution can't do that unless they had some sort of constitutional amendment and you know and, and equal if they did stand down i mean they could stand down in caroline lucas's seat which to be honest, is a safe green seat and doesn't matter if Labour stand there or not. And they they basically played it soft in her seat in the last two elections. They didn't really throw any resources at it. But, all, I mean, in, in practical terms, how would it work? Because there's not really any other seats in the country where Labour could say, we'll go easy or soft because the Greens are likely a, more, a better place to take it than us. And they, they're not going to give up a seat because that would well, make it sense. That's the whole point of the negotiations, basically. I mean, this is this is the thing. So Stroud is going to Stroud would be really hard for us to give up um, because it's our spiritual home, practically. You know, that's that's the thing. It's Tory's political home now. Almost, so. we'd almost, you know, we'd, we'd we'd exchange a lot of other things for Stroud in the negotiations. So it's you know these things all need to be talked about. I think, um, and and it absolutely, you know, it shouldn't be the case that you only get to, to fight the seats you'd win anyway, because what's the point of that? Um, now, I want to point you at a, a poll that YouGov did um, a few years ago um, that I sort of suggested they might try, and it was very, very interesting. So what they asked people to do was not say how they were going to vote. They asked people to make their ideal parliament. So they said to people, adjust these sliders for how much, how many votes you think, how many seats you think each party should have in an ideal parliament. And it was really, really interesting. I mean, obviously, everyone was quite partisan about what they did. <laughs> you know, the majority of Labour voters gave themselves a massive majority. But ev- almost every single person, and this is, you know, we're, they're reporting on the averages in each group of voters, almost everybody gave some votes to, to opposition parties because they recognised the value of opposition. And when you asked people on average, you know, how many Greens there should be, people were giving us, I think the average was 33 seats that's from oh, yeah. the yeah, political no question in a different electoral yeah. system you get loads more seats yeah, yeah no, so in a but we don't have that electoral system yeah so in a, so in a one-off election designed to create the ideal election system to create this a parliament of people who want to change things in politics for the good to move towards a more cooperative um system then you ought to be arranging that, that there's a reasonable number of each. And obviously 33 is not my opening, you know, that's not my necessarily my opening pitch. That's something to be talked about. But in general, people want to see a balance. Um, they wouldn't want to see, and you'd want to see, have some insurance in there against the Trudeau effect happening. If once you, Because obviously changing it to PR is part of the goal. So that's, you know, that's that's my offer to Labour. And I did write to, to Keir Starmer about this. Me and Jonathan did as soon as he was elected. Um, to see if we could have a chat, like a really just honest chat about what is and isn't possible, you know, nothing, you know, just to see if there was the possibility of an honest kind of chat where we can talk on that, on the kind of basis I'm doing with you now. Did he reply? No, <laughs> not officially. I mean, I bump into him, but it's like... I mean, you, you, you run after him. So he just nearby, but I'm not going to run up to him and go, oh, he wears my meeting in the supermarket. Um, or through all the official channels, we've had no reply. That is that is harsh. They are a tough crowd, honestly. Yeah. And I just think an honest sit down and a chat about, you know, okay, he might just say this is never going to be possible, 
but I will have a meeting with Clive to discuss it further. That would be a start, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be really interested to know what would be thrashed out. Right. A couple yeah. of other questions. Important. So, yeah, what, 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 what seats are what? You know, all of that is for negotiation. You know, there are there are some... And, and it's like, you know, I'm not proposing this at the moment. I mean, basically, I'm sitting here going, they're going to have to come to me about this now because, I you know, I've put a lot of political capital internally within the party into pushing for these things. Um, externally, we've spent political capital on this as well. And, and really, it is for Labour to come around, realise it's in their best interest too. This is how we do it in a fair way that respects the other parties and isn't just trying to push them aside. It's, it's, it's their move. If the Greens got up to 15%, for example, consistently, if a lot of people, particularly because a lot there are a lot of younger voters who are leftish inclined, climate emergency is a big deal, particularly for younger voters. And actually, the last surge you had back in 2014-15, the climate emergency is a much bigger deal for people. And also because of the Corbyn era, whatever people think about Corbyn as leader and so on, those policies, a lot of policies which weren't in the mainstream, people got a taste of, quite liked them. And if they're taken away, people are like, what? So they might see the Greens loudly talking about these things, plus the climate emergency, feel a bit disillusioned with Labour and come to you. So if you end up with 15%, do you think then you'd be in a place, place of, oh, going to reply to my message now? <laughs> hey? You, you know, you can't expect everyone to be that self, you know, that self-interested. But true. I mean, what, what you're saying there is interesting, though, because what you're saying is there's, the Corbyn era, the you know, the green surge that then was the, the then was the the Corbyn surge and 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 Corbyn's sort of term of of office where where things moved to the left, where things like bringing public services back into public hands became more mainstream, where things like um, austerity somewhat lost their flavour, and and we'll see. I'm I'm still thinking we've got the the mother of all battles to stop a new era austerity. Quite honestly, um, but there is some sense that the government are saying they're going to invest. Um, so we may be we may have opened up quite a lot of political space there that will still remain, mm -hmm. um, and somebody needs to represent it. So yes, there's a there's hopefully a good chance that people will see that the Greens are the ones still pushing for full throatedly for a platform that is the right one that is the values that we we give you know, the values of equality the values of investment the values of um <laughs> just acting on climate change um you know human rights civil liberties all of those things are still things that people want and i'm hoping that that the political space for that hasn't gone away and it's never been a zero-sum game for members between us and Labour. This idea that all these people join the Greens and they join Labour. No, over, over, over that period of time, the people in both parties increased enormously. Mm. And, and an era of apathy around about 2015 more or less ended. Yeah, and are young much more politicised. Are much what? more politicised and, and interested in being involved in, commu and, in um, community activity and community activity that's explicitly political as well i mean you look at the wider things like extinction rebellion those are those are the same things those are explicitly political in their um in their activity they're challenging they're forward looking they're they're part of quite radical change and that's a big movement I, i've got something to talk to you about actually sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had two other questions I wanted to put to you, but uh, hit me with it. Go on. If you're changing the subject, then don't, because I want to talk to you about this. No, I wasn't. I was going to talk about the climate emergency for a start, which I thought was no, quite okay. important. Well, no, we'll do that. We'll do that in a minute. We'll do that. We'll have a green. Carry on. So the thing I wanted to talk to you about, and this is, I've been looking, trying to find my, my bit of speech that I wanted to tell you. So do you remember there was, um, in the summer of 2015, there was a, um, an event in... Um, the Roundhouse in Camden that Compass organised that was called Utopia. Let me get this right. Oh, yeah, I think I do remember. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this was during the election, for the first election that, that Jeremy Corbyn fought. Right. So we'd had a big increase in Greens joining us. And a lot of people were now not necessarily they weren't leaving the Greeks, they were they were a lot of people were joining Labour. So this this thing that I said, this non-zero sum game of people going into um political parties who'd been part of what was already then a growing 
movement on the ground of people representing um, renters. You know, that's the, the election I was I speak. Sorry, I was speaking there as a candidate to be the Green uh, candidate. Yeah, because I spoke as well, didn't I? And you speaking I was, there as well. The point is, we both spoke at this. Event. I remember because I was there, and I did that because I was yeah. obviously supporting Jeremy Corbyn's leadership video. I remember now. And you were speaking. Yeah, you were saying to people, "Go vote for Jeremy Corbyn," and I'm saying, "Go back me to be the Green candidate." And our thesis was more or less the same. The thesis of this is a moment of renewed. Radicalism. People are looking for big changes. People want to transform the way we do economics. They want to transform society. Um, you know, we could see the the coming cultural um, battles around Brexit coming, and and we we knew that people were picking a side and joining up for those reasons as well. And we said very similar things. And I don't know if you actually stayed to watch my speech, <laughs> but you should go back and watch it. I did. I'm sure I will. I'll check it up on YouTube. I'm sure I did. That was six years ago. It was a long, quite a lot has happened since then. But Charm. both of us were completely correct about what was coming and why. Yeah. And those, and I think, you know, nothing that's happened in the last six years has actually dimmed the feeling that there is in the wider society of people wanting to be involved in things. And I think, you know, all of us owe it to those people to have um you know a strong radical left uh libertarian <laughs> equality driven green politics that is a little bit more united that is a little bit more constructive with each other and isn't just coming to blows over stroud quite honestly yeah. i all think comes back, all comes back to stroud just because just at like, that time we were terribly nice about each other and we can yeah we can... i'm always nice about you i've always been a big fan just a couple of <laughs> couple of, couple of last things before I ask you about the climate emergency, something that is important to, to talk about, you've taken a very courageous and principled stance in support of trans rights. And tr in support of trans rights. Just correct. Uh, not courageous, just correct. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. It should be just correct. But there is a very vicious and obsessive anti... That's what I'm trying to say. There's a very vicious and obsessed anti-trans lobby in this country who are quite cult-like in the way they operate and they hound trans people and they also hound allies of trans people in an obsessive way mm -hmm. i suppose my question is why do you think because in the united states i ask this this comes up quite a lot um in the us people who are obsessed with trans people in a very bad way tend to be republicans and the right mm -hmm. whilst actually whether you're a centrist or a leftist and feminism overall trans inclusive but that's not true here you get transphobia it's not just something on the right you have it amongst people who call themselves centrist amongst people who call themselves left people in the SNP, people in labor and people in the green party what is that all about i'm i'm as i'm with you on this basically <laughs> everything i see you say about this is so the correct analysis i think and it is really really tough that there has been it, it, these are organized campaigns let's not you know let's not beat about the bush here these this is not something that that's that's naturally sprung out of any of the groups that they've targeted to try and convert there is there is something organized and and it's it's really insidious it, it is and it is and i try not to sort of be conspiracy theory ish about this but it's part of the same thing thing that's 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 racist it's part of the same um feeling of not supporting equality of wanting to create division of wanting to 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 demonize certain people and it's a it's a bullying mentality and i think the fact that that they've lost the battle for things like you know um equal marriage um and like the, the in America where it's more of a thing they've lost the battle over like abortion rights for example they've moved on to this new target which is our trans brothers and sisters and it's just really 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 poor and I think you know we have to stand up to it in in organizations that are being targeted um where there's there's people trying to get positions within the Green Party that I don't agree with them on and I think it's important that we stand up and we say what's right um, and as allies, I think it's important that we do make sure that our trans siblings have a voice as well and that, and that we're trying to protect them from harassment while they have the voice and are the spokespeople for their own cause. 
Um, but I think in the end, you've got to draw some lines and you've got to take some action. And, and so, yeah, that's that's where I'm at with this. But it's 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 grim to be the, t- the subject of such a campaign and the target of it um, as an organisation, because it's really hard to make those arguments mm-hmm. um, against against what can be quite cleverly hidden bigotry, but it is bigotry. Lastly, the climate emergency. There are millions of people out there who know it's an existential threat to humanity. They know urgent action needs to be taken and they find it boring. They shouldn't, but they do. They get, they find it. They Someone starts talking about it. They're like, oh, I know it's important, but oh, I've got other things to worry about in life, etc." How do you make the climate emergency a tangible bread and butter issue that people see, not as some long-term wonky scientific thing, that's something they urgently need to do to, to, to fight and support urgent action to deal with now, yesterday even? I think, I mean, I think the majority of people are very, very on board with the principle. If you ask, should we deal with the climate emergency? Should we set the right targets? I don't know, 80% of people are like, yes, we should take urgent action. That's that's kind of where we're at. And asking people at the moment about the recovery from the coronavirus crisis, I think is really instructive along these, along these lines because previously in the last um, financial crisis, you would ask people, well, people became convinced by the austerity argument. People thought that we just needed to sort of buckle down and do as little as possible and that green investment was was a luxury we couldn't afford and i think although there are some people who will still say that that feeling is is not there when you ask people in opinion polls people want to build back greener the people want to invest to transform um and restore um like the economy and and the jobs and all of that um and i said i'm stop going to stop short of saying restore growth but we do need to keep the economy going we need to keep a sustainable economy that, that maintains people's jobs and that can be done through investment um in green things and people really are on board with that and people are on board with things that are related to climate change that are, that are totally next door to it in terms of resource use um we saw a lot of activism around plastic waste but the the embodied carbon in so much of the stuff that we buy the the fact that carbon tracks resource use so closely is coming out in all kinds of ways i was just talking to architects about trying to fight demolition um and that's a really new campaign in the last few years and they're looking at the carbon impact of demolishing homes not just the social impact which i've been fighting on for a long time and that coming together of those kinds of different reasons in one campaign is is really exciting but also things like air pollution, very closely linked to fossil fuel burning. People kills seeing more people globally than pollution. Oh, sorry, pollution <laughs> kills more people globally than tobacco. That's what I meant. Yes, exactly. It's a huge killer, an absolute huge killer. And it's now that we're we're starting to deal with transport, the other sources of pollution, people are taking a much more rounded view of that as well. So I think there's there's genuine hope that people are starting to make the links between all of these things, the gaps that we leave for inequality, the the, the need to, to build back better, the need to deal with, with health threats of pollution and the ultimate need to, to, in the future, deal with climate chaos, to meet those targets that we need to meet within 10 years. And I think when it was just let's meet the targets, people were eas- more easily able to sort of put that aside or or you know, not deny it because that's climate denial, but but sort of just you know ignore it and 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 save it for later and, and say it's you know not for today because it's too scary. Um, and I think people now are tying together the positive solutions in, in and they want different and they want the new world that we could bring and and that you know being able to stand for something that's so positive that does this 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 and this that it actually builds a new world that's fair and green and all those things. People are up for hearing about that in a way that. They're taking much more seriously than they used to. This is now a, a more mainstream point of view to have. The question is, how, will it be done properly? And that's why you need Greens elected. So these are much better arguments for me to be having than just whether or not we're all doomed, which was the debate up until, I mean, on the BBC, that was still the way they had the debate. Up yeah, they until still like, had climate deniers on as a legitimate opposition you know, like they still of- were doing that until yeah. very, very recently. They will still do that. We have a flat earther on, and as long are. as we have someone to oppose the flat earther, it's balanced. Yes, and now it's more like, how are we going to solve this, and how yeah. quickly, and in what ways, and who do we listen to, 
um, and and who's got the best ideas and, and do we do it? I mean, you know, the Bill Gates thing and do we, you know, all of those arguments. Those are better arguments to be having than is there any point? So that's really good. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've covered so much ground. We, we need to talk next time during the mayoral elections because, of course, you're standing as the green mayoral candidate. But we'll come back to that. We'll revisit that. But um, that was incredible. That was brilliant. That was It was absolute huge insight and great to have a little discussion about differences. And I think this was um, – I think it's important because there's going to be lots of people out there, progressives, who are – thinking over where, you know, where next, what are the best avenues. And even though I'm a Labour man, I was born into a, a family in which Labourism is very integral to my family and to how I see the world. It's so important for me to talk to Greens who I may disagree on which party to support, but we've got so much we agree on in terms of the absolute actual issues. And that's that's really important to discuss different strategies and approaches to try and get to the same place. So I really appreciate talking to you. Um, you too. And I should have mentioned when you asked me about polls, I should have gone about how well we're doing in the polls in London, because we are going to be at 15 percent in the next poll, I reckon. So I think we'll be somewhere there. I'm sure a lot of young lefties and young people who care about the planet. Almost certainly. I mean, Labour, Sadiq Khan got to pay attention to those people clearly yeah so, we just pay attention to me in the london assembly already so that's good but, yeah um, exactly. I mean, do nice. paying more attention yeah yeah um but it's a real pleasure and uh we will speak soon but i really appreciate that thank you we're never going to succeed in radicalizing politics and doing what must be done on behalf of the many if we do not challenge the dominance of the establishment media uh, with our own media. So support Owen Jones' team on Patreon.